So first of all, let's recall what we mean by linear uh, when we talk about linear. Of course, first order, that's what we're talking about the entire chapter. But first order just means we only have the first derivative. Now, linear means linear with respect to y. Linear with respect to y and its derivative. So anytime a derivative shows up of y, anytime y shows up, they're to the first power. No two are multiplied together. It's basically a function of x times y, the derivative of y plus a function of x times y maybe equals a function of x. So I could write that like this. a1 of x dy dx plus a0 of x y equals maybe a right-hand side function b of x. I mean, so think of it in terms of those variables that it's linear in. The yellow here are the variables. This, say green here, these are the coefficients, like the constant terms. They're constant with respect to y, meaning they don't depend on y at all. So this looks like ax plus by equals c, only now it's a function of x times dy dx plus a function of x times y equals a function of x. So, so those things in front, they could be constants, they could be complicated things in x, but they don't have y's in them, the thing that's multiplied times there. So that is what we will be able to solve by the time we get done with this. Now, look at these two. One of those is linear and one is not. Which one's linear? Of these two examples below. What does that cube tell you? Right? you got to have everything to the first power. The other problem is right here. Right? You've got a function times a function. That is y times another y. You can't have that. Right, this is like, this would be like my b. If I rewrote this in the same format as what I've got above, I would write it as sine of x dy dx, move this to that side and write it on the left, I would write it as minus cosine of x times y equals x squared sine of x. So notice you can now identify the a1, a0, and the b. But you may have to rearrange things in order to see that it's linear. But you can even look at this first equation, A, and see that it's linear because y's only appear to the first power, dy, dx to the first power. No two of them are multiplied together. You don't have any nonlinear functions of y. It doesn't matter what happens to x, the independent variable, that is. So this would be plus? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I tend to be a little sloppy with that kind of stuff, so I'm glad you guys are catching this. So how do we solve them? So we're going to break this down into cases. Um, in fact, there's kind of three cases here, even though I have two Roman numerals. Case one is if there is no a naught, life is very simple. Right? Look at this... Uh, blank up here, if a naught was zero, that is, if there was no y term at all. That's easy to solve, right? How would you find dy dx if I told you that dy dx satisfies this differential equation? Some function of x, dy dx equals some function of x. I, I'm, first, I would solve for dy dx, right? This means that dy dx is equal to whatever b of x is divided by whatever a1 of x is. And that's a Cal 1 problem, maybe Cal 2, because the right-hand side has no y's. Those are the easiest of differential equations. Okay? We've talked about ones, we gave them a name even, the ones that had no x's on the left-hand side. We called those autonomous, and we did face portraits for them. 
Um, but they're still a little bit more complicated to solve, although they are all separable, so we could use our technique from section 2.2 if you only had y's on the right-hand side. But it's even easier when you only have x's, in the sense that all you got to do is integrate both sides with respect to x. Integrate dx, integrate dx. y would be whatever the integral of b of x, a1 of x, dx is. Okay, which means that's back to Cal 1. Can you just integrate that resulting function of x? You know, like, I mean, if, if the function was like, uh, we'll thought bubble up here. If I just had x squared dy dx is equal to, um, natural log, actually maybe I'll just make it even stupid, stupid easy, x cubed. I want to find the function y that when you take x squared times the derivative of it, you get x cubed. Yeah, you can solve that, right? Yes. dy dx is... Oh, I'm sorry. X. x, so y is... 1 half x squared. Plus c. Plus c. And done, right? It all boils down to how easy is it to integrate. Um, what we're going to assume from this point going forward is if I say something is easy to do in differential equations, it's with a disclaimer. It assumes that you can integrate it. Even though, as you probably will remember, integration is not always easy by itself. <coughs> but I'm going to assume once we can say it's just the integral of something, then I'm done talking about differential equations, and now I'm just doing calculus, and we're assuming it can be done. One way or another, whether by approximations or by sophisticated integration techniques that were extremely difficult whenever you took Cal 2, but whatever. Once you get to an integral, we're happy, okay? I got to an integral, I'm happy. That's the easy part. Now let's move on. What happens if it's not simple? That is, what if A of 0, or A naught, is not 0? And then you have something that looks like the general problem. Now, in general, that's not going to be easy to do. Uh, but there is one circumstance where it is immediately obvious how to solve, or should be immediately obvious. If this function right here happened to be the derivative of a1, If that function, the a naught, just by chance, by sheer luck alone, is the derivative of the function that's times the dy dx, then there becomes something obvious that we can do. What is the thing that is obvious? I want you to look at this. That means you have this. a1 of x dy dx equals, no, not equals, plus... plus a1 prime of x, y, equals b of x. Does anybody recognize what that is right there? Not quite. Is when you're trying to derive two functions that are both partially the same. Which is called the product rule. Product. Right? Because you have a function times the derivative mm -hmm. plus the derivative times the function. First times the derivative of the second plus second times the derivative of the first. This is the product rule. Which means it's the same thing as d dx of the two functions without their derivatives. Whatever a1 of x is, right? And instead of dy dx, it's the function without the derivative, so y. Right? If I ask you to find the derivative 
of a1 of x times y, you would do a1 of x times dy dx plus a1 prime of x times y. First times the derivative of the second plus second times the derivative of the first equals b of x. Now you've got the derivative of a function equals another function. So to get rid of that derivative, what would I do? Integrate both sides, right? Integrate both sides. So you'll have the integral of the derivative, a1 of x, y, dx, equals the integral of b of x, dx. So now we assume integral of b of x, dx is easy, done, piece of cake. Okay? On the right-hand side, the integral and the derivative basically cancel each other out, so you have a1 of x, y, equals the integral of b of x, dx. Or y is equal to 1 over a1 of x times the integral of b of x, dx. And I won't put just plus c because that's... That will happen whenever I take the integral of b of x, right? I'm just going to assume that the plus c is included in that integral of b of x. When you actually do this in practice, you have to do the integral so you'll have a plus c. But the plus c will also be multiplied by that uh, a1, 1 over a1 of x. But you now have a solution. All you have to do is take 1 over a1 of x, integral of b of x dx, in that special case. Again, the special case is if we get lucky that the a1 prime happens to be the same thing as a naught. But what about the rest of the time? In practice, this will rarely happen. But we can make it happen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to find a function to multiply in on both sides that forces the function that's in front of the y to be the derivative of the other function. Now, to make that happen, I'm going to simplify my notation just a little bit. Instead of starting with the problem in this form, the first thing I'm going to do is divide through by a1 of x, and I want to write my form in this way. dy dx plus a0 of x over a1 of x y equals b of x over a1 of x. I want to solve only first order linear problems where the coefficient in front of the derivative is 1. But I can always do that because all I got to do is divide through by a1. That means I only actually have two functions to work with instead of three. I'm going to call that p of x. I'm going to call this q of x. So I'm going to start with things in this form. Okay. So I'm just talking about doing a form change. Instead of a1 of x dy dx plus a0 of x y equals b of x, I want to do it in terms of p's and q's. dy dx plus p of x y equals q of x. So if you're going to solve one of these, first thing you want to do is get it in this form. Put a 1 in front of the dy dx. Okay? And then I'm going to use a function, mu of x, that I'm going to call an integrating factor. And I'm going to multiply this equation right here in yellow, this guy right here. I want to multiply that through by mu of x. So what I'll have is mu of x dy dx plus mu of x p of x y equals mu of x q of x. Now again, what we want is a relationship between these two things, right? We want this function right here to be the derivative of this function right there. 
so that mu prime is equal to mu p. The derivative of mu is mu p. All right, the good news is this is separable. I can keep the p's on one side and the mu's on the other. I mean, this basically says d mu dx is equal to mu p of x. So that would be 1 over mu d mu equals p of x dx. Right? So I'm trying to find a function that if I multiply through, that mu happens to be the function. When I take its derivative, I get mu, the p that was in the original problem, mu times p. If you solve this for mu, then essentially I will have a technique for solving all linear differential equations. Because all I got to do is this I got to find the mu multiply everything by the mu, use that product rule just like I did on the previous example to solve for y. Okay, I'll, and I'll walk you through that. Let me show you what that looks like. First of all, we got to solve this, right? Integrate both sides here. What is the integral of 1 over mu d mu? Natural log of mu. Natural log of mu. Integral of p of x dx, I have no idea what that is unless I know P. But P is going to change from one problem to the next. So the thing on the right hand side here is going to depend on the problem you're working. So whatever P is, if P turns out to be X, then that's one half X squared. If P was sine, then it's negative cosine. If P was um, E to the X, then it's E to the X. Whatever P is, you're going to take the integral of it. But we need to solve for mu, so mu will be E to this side. Just take the exponential of both sides. e to the integral p of x dx. So this is what you want to remember off of this page. Most important thing right there. The good news is we don't have to derive this formula every time. We now know how to find the integrating factor. If you're going to solve a first order linear system, you're going to start by finding an integrating factor and that's how you find it right there e to the integral of p of x dx. Okay, so back to number two. Number two was um, the formula I wrote in the blank just above here. In fact, I'm just going to scroll up. It's this guy. So back to this thing. Now I know that the thing that's in green on the right is the derivative of the, th or actually, the derivative of the first green is equal to the second green. So I've got a first times a derivative plus the derivative times a first. So what that now means is I've got mu, and I'm going to leave out the of x's just because it's messy. If you don't mind, I'll switch to just writing mu dy dx instead of mu of x. Plus, now I had mu p, right? But I've now found mu so that that's mu prime. Y equals mu b, uh, q, mu q. Right, all I've done is taken what's right up here and said that's mu dy dx plus mu prime y equals mu q. And now I can rewrite this using the product rule. That's d dx of mu y equals mu q. Integrate both sides. Here's what you've got. 
mu y equals the integral of mu q dx. So y will be 1 over mu, the integral, mu q dx. All right, so do you understand my strategy on this? We're turning the left-hand side of a linear system into the product rule by choosing a function that makes that second coefficient the derivative of the first. So what you have actually on the screen right now is enough to solve these. Once you know what P and Q are, all you've got to do is find mu that way, mu up here this way. Take e to the integral of p. And then your answer is going to be this. 1 over that mu times the integral of whatever mu times q gives you. Remember, mu and q are going to have x's in them, so I can't just cancel the mu's from inside and outside the integral. But that, that gives me an explicit solution as long as I can integrate. And like I said, once we get to integrals, then we assume that we've We've been successful. So I'm just going to write again in the box here a full version of this formula. And throw in the plus C just so that you don't forget it. Okay. Now, just so that you have it all in one place, um, here are the step-by-steps -step we're going to do for linear equations going forward. First thing you do is write it in standard form, dy dx plus p of x, y equals q of x. Calculate the integrating factor by e to the integral of p of x dx. That's going to be do what? P of x or p of y? Up here? Yeah. X. So then you have d dx of mu y equals q or mu times q. And you integrate that equation and solve for y. Now, you can do one of two things, to be honest with you. One, you could memorize equation number three and just always use that what's in the box. Um, which is fine by me. Um, just know that what I will probably do every time I work these problems is I will, I will write out the product rule, condense it, integrate it, just because that's the way that I remember what this method is doing. Like what I will do is I will multiply in the mu's, I will then write it like this, I'll integrate both sides, and then I'll solve for y. So I'll go through extra steps instead of just writing down the formula for the answer, but you're more than welcome to just know this formula you're going to get the same answer either way. Okay. Let's do one. Now, I've, let's, I've started with one that is in uh, standard form already. So what's your P of X? Just negative 3. It's the thing times the Y. And then Q of X is just 0. So if I use the integrating factor method to solve this, first thing I'm going to do is find mu. Which is e to the integral of p of x dx. So e to the integral negative 3 dx. e to the negative 3x, yes. And don't worry about plus c's here. You only need one integrating factor, not 
an infinite number of them, so I don't don't put a plus C up there, even though it would work for any C. That's not where your C is going to come into play. Okay? Then multiply in this times that equation. What I get is e to the negative 3x dy dx minus 3e to the minus 3x y equals 0. And I, I mean, I, I just like to do this because it's so cool to me. You see now a perfect application of the product rule. A function times a derivative plus a derivative times a function. Notice how this, no, this, this guy right here, I'll even highlight it, my green color. Notice how this right here and this are related to each other now. That second one is the derivative of the first one, isn't it? If you did this right, that's always going to happen. So this is now d dx of e to the negative 3x times y. This will always be d dx of mu y. Notice how that's my mu right there, that e to the minus 3x. It's the e to the minus 3x I got right there. equals zero. Integrate both sides. You get e to the negative 3x y equals a constant. So y is e to the 3x with that constant out front. Right, just multiplied by e to the 3x or divided by e to the minus 3x either way. And there you go. Um, by the way, I was sloppy about one thing up here I need to go fix. I just noticed it while we were working this problem. Um, so give me a nod when I can scroll up and you've got this. Okay. All right, up here, I need to do this. Because that plus C comes from that integral. So when you move the mu x to the other side, it's going to be multiplied times the constant. The 1 over mu x is. So you can't just absorb it and throw in a plus C at the end. It's actually times that function, right? Because, you know, technically where that plus C comes from is from this integral right there. So when I do that integration, I put a plus C in there, then I move the mu over. The mu is going to be times that. The 1 over mu is going to be times that C. Which is what happened right here, right? That's where I got C e to the 3x. Um, just a side note here on this problem. This is not the only technique you have to be able to solve this particular equation, right? If I had started with the equation and said dy dx equals 3y, you already have a tool to solve that. Do you know what it is? How would you solve that another way besides what we just did? Separation. Separation. Move the y, move the y to the left-hand side and the dx to the other and integrate both sides. So this is an example of a separable equation. Not all first-order linear equations are separable. But now we have a technique that solves all the ones that are not. All right, let's do another one. A couple more. And I'll speed up a little bit on the next two. <coughs> next one? I just have one question. Yes. Why do we multiply e to the 3x to the right hand side instead of the right hand side? You mean up here? Yeah. I did. What's 0 times e to the minus 3x? Uh, e to the 3x. Yeah. 
zero times e to the minus three x. Anything times zero is zero. zero. So I did. So technically that's e to the minus three x, but that goes to zero. That's why I just wrote a zero over there. So in general, and as you will see on the next problem, I will multiply mu times all three terms. Is that what you were asking? So I multiplied e to the minus 3x here, here, and here. On the left-hand side, I multiplied by both of them because it distributed. But I got the e to the minus 3x, a minus 3, e to the minus 3x, and 0 e to the minus 3x, which is 0. Because 0 times any function is still the 0 function. Okay? All right, let's try another one. It, it starts to click the more you do it. You've got to do these over and over again to get the hang of it. But the technique nicely about these is always the same. Find mu, multiply through by mu, rewrite the product rule, integrate, solve for y. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, we've got to get this in standard form because it's not. Notice that. So what would you do? That would cancel this out and give me a 1 and change the other 2, which should work, right? Yes. Multiply by x. You get dy dx. Minus, what, 2 over x times y? I'm going to separate the 2 over x out front so I can see that that's my p. Okay. Okay. You got it? And then the other side becomes. There we go. Does your so your so whatever's in front of your dy dx you have to get it to one. Yes. So that your integrating factor is just the formula e to the mu e to the integral of p of x dx. Okay, so let's do mu. Mu is e to the integral of right here is your p of x. Agreed? So negative 2 over x dx. e to the negative 2 log of x. But we can simplify that. That's the, that's the trick here. When you see logs in there, you know e's and logs cancel. So what I would do is rewrite this as e to the log of x to the negative 2. Right? Power to a power, you multiply exponents. to the negative 2, or 1 over x squared. Do y'all see what I did on this step right here? Okay. I mean, it's just, once you see e's and logs together, you know you're going to do something to try to simplify those and make them easier to do. All right, so now what I do is I take this and multiply it times that equation right there. So what do I end up with? I multiply everything on you know, this resulting standard equation right here by 1 over x squared. I'm going to get 1 over x squared dy dx minus 2 over x cubed mm -hmm. y equals cosine, cosine x. And you see, again, it's beautiful to me. This almost appears out of nowhere. This, you take its derivative, you get this. 
And that's slick. I think it's slick. That was Dr. Alm's favorite adjective. He said that probably once every other week. Boy, that's slick. That's snappy. I think it's nifty. That would be my adjective to describe that. Maybe a little sexy. So you need more sexy mathematics. Man, it's like Adam, whew, that looks, you just lean back and you, you admire it, you know? That looks good. Because now, it's all, it's all coasting in. Because you can write this as d dx of 1 over x squared, oops, x squared y equals cosine of x. Integrate both sides. You get 1 over x squared y equals integral of cosine. That's right, derivative of sine is cosine. So that's the phrase that I always remember, so I have to reverse that in my head. Derivative of sine is cosine. From that, I know everything else. Plus c. So y is? x squared sine of x plus c. Plus c x squared. An arbitrary constant times a function is not an arbitrary constant, so you have to just leave the x squared in there. It's only when we have combinations of arbitrary constants together or functions of only arbitrary constants that I replace them with some new c. But a constant times x squared is, is not just a constant. It's, it's that constant times x squared. So you've got to leave that in there. You can't just make it a new c. Yes, sir? The yellow highlight that you have there on that line, Yeah. where did that come from? Why did we plug... I multiplied this equation right here through by this right here, right? So out in front here now, I have 1 over x squared. I multiplied this by 1 over x squared, and I multiplied this by 1 over x squared. And that's... And, uh, right. That's what we did way back up here. We were deriving this. I multiplied this equation, well, actually, the, this equation in yellow, or orange, or whatever that is, by mu. Mu, mu, mu. And now, because I've chosen mu so that mu prime is mu, then that gives me d dx of mu y equals mu times the right-hand side, right? And it, you, again, you see it as you go. When I multiply through by 1 over x squared, this now, if I take its derivative, gives me this. So I can just rewrite it as the product rule, derivative of this function times y. That's what the left-hand side actually is. 1 over x squared dy dx minus 2 over x cubed y. And the right-hand side, which was originally x squared cosine x, is now, you know, in this case, nicely chosen so it was easy to integrate. Well, it doesn't always happen that way, but does that answer your question? Yes. Are we good on that one? Let's do one application that will result in a, um, a linear equation that models something happening in, in reality. Um, we've got um, a radioactive decay problem that I want us to tackle. Um, what we've got are two radioactive isotopes. One decays into the other, and then that second one, RA2, decays into something else. Okay. So if I were to draw a picture, it's like uh, RA1 turns into Ra2, which turns into something else, which I don't even have to label. What we want to model in this case is Ra2. I'm going to let Y of T be the amount of that second radioactive isotope at time T. So to model that, we're going to identify how fast, what's the rate coming in here, which I'm calling the creation rate, and then its own decay rate. So notice the creation rate of RA2 is the decay rate of RA1. 
And they tell us in this problem that the RA1 decays to RA2 by this formula right there. And that RA2, its decay rate, is proportional to the mass of RA2. This phrase right here is how we modeled it in chapter 2. No, chapter 1. 1 1.3. When we said, when we're doing radioactive decay, we said a, a radioactive element decays at a rate proportional to the amount that's there. So that's that KY formula. So using all those pieces together, what does our differential equation look like? dy dt would be the rate of creation, which is what? 50 minus the rate of decay. Proportional means directly proportional. You multiply by a constant proportionality. So KY. KY. And I'll just assume y is a function of t. I'm not going to write the idea. So there's your differential equation based on the information given. We know a decay rate, and we know a creation rate. Rate coming in, rate going out. All right, now they're going to give us some specifics. Let's say k is 2, y of not, or y at 0 is 40 kilograms. We want to find a formula for y of t. So we'll have an initial value problem. Looks like this. dy dt is equal to 50 e to the minus 10 t minus 2y. Where y at 0 is 40. So there's our problem. So we'll have, just like with all initial value problems, two steps, solve the differential equation, and then find the constant using the initial condition. All right, so let's start with dy dt equals 50 e to the minus. In fact, I tell you what, let's get it in standard form, right? We'll all we got to do to get in standard form is move that to the other side. The y term. So plus 2y equals 50e to the minus 10t. Y'all see why I moved the y, right? Because it's you put dy dx plus the thing times y equals just the stuff with x's in it. That's the standard form. So your P in this case is, and your Q over here, 50 e to the minus 10 t. Okay, so let's find mu. Mu will be e the integral of 2 dt. So that's e to the No, 2 is not a variable. Thank you. It's alright, we've all been there. Alright, now e to the 2t. What do I do with that? Multiply times my differential equation, right? Yeah. <coughs> so I've got e to the 2t dy dt plus 2e to the 2t y equals What do I get on the right-hand side? I have 50 e to the minus 10 t times e to the 2 t, right? 50 e to the negative 8 t. Yep. 
All right, you take a second. You admire the beauty of the equation. All right, I should have put that step in there. This is step like B and a half. Admire the beauty of the product rule. All right, do you see it? E to the 2t takes derivative to get 2e to the 2t. Wow. All right, so then stop admiring and move on. D dt is e to the 2ty. D to the dt of e to the 2ty equals 50 e to the negative 8t. Again, all I'm doing on this step is I'm recognizing the product rule. Integrate both sides. E to the 2ty equals the integral of e to the minus 8t all times 50. So far, so good? Yes. And then multiply through or divide by e to the 2t. I'm going to multiply by e to the negative 2t. Oh. Right? Because that that's the same as dividing by e to the 2t. Mm -hmm. So I get y equals this negative 50 over 8 is negative 25 over 4 mm -hmm. reduced. If you divide by e to the negative Sorry, if you multiply by e to the negative 2t, multiply this here, here, and here, I'm going to get e to the negative 2 times e to the minus 8t is e to the negative 10t plus c e to the negative 2t. You mean the separation from 2.2? Yes. Well, when, the, when it's separable, um, as long as it's linear, you can use this. So not all separable equations are linear, and not all linear equations are separable. But there are some overlap. I showed you one that was both. Okay? When both techniques apply, either technique will work. But there are some for which... Only one technique will apply. Okay, but I'm not done with this problem yet. I'm close. I've got y, but what kind of problem did I start with? Initial value. So I got to find c. That's why there's a little space. Oh, look at this extra space. How convenient. All right, so I'm going to rewrite my answer. Y equals negative 25 fourths e to the negative 10t plus c e to the negative 2t. All right, use y of 0 is 40. What am I plugging in for t? And for y, 40 equals negative 25 fourths e to the negative 10 times 0 plus c e to the negative 2 times 0. Ones. So you get 40 equals negative 25 fourths plus c. Which means c is 40 plus 25 over 4. Or 165, no, 185 over 4. Because 40 is 160 over 4, so that's 185 fourths. Y equals, y'all see where I got the C? That's pretty easy, right? Yeah. Okay, so negative 25 fourths e to the negative 10t plus 185 fourths e to the negative 2t. Now before we wrap on this, let me uh, 
point out a couple of interesting things that we can we can now do now that we know the actual function. We have a predictor for what the amount of that radioactive isotope is going to be at any given time t. But one common question to ask is what happens in the long term? And whenever you're asked what happens in the long term, that means as t goes to infinity. What happens to the amount of that substance as t goes to infinity? It decreases. Decreases to what? It goes to zero, right? Because of the negative exponents. Which is kind of what you would expect from this model, right? Um, we, we are assuming we don't have an infinite supply of the RA1 coming in. In fact, if you look at the rate of time, the rate coming in from RA also decreases as a function of time. So eventually, over time, you get zero, right? It approaches zero how much is coming in at any given time t. So you would expect. Now, if you had some kind of system set up where things were coming into RA1 and then RA1 was feeding into RA2 and then RA2 was decaying, as long as you had a supply line, it wasn't necessarily go to zero. But according to this model, because of the rate coming in that was given to us, that's what we would expect. Okay? Um, I hate to minimize the importance of this, but I'm tagging it in at the end of each of these sections um, where it's important to make this point. But it's not a huge component of this class to know when and why we know that equations have solutions and unique solutions of that. We did mention it in Chapter 1. I'm going to mention it again now that um, initial value problems can be shown to have unique solutions under certain conditions. For these types of problems, here's what you have to have in order to know that you're going to get a unique solution out of it. If P and Q in my equation, in my standard form, are continuous on an open interval that contains the x naught, your starting point, then for any y naught, there is a unique solution to this initial value problem. So all you need in order for this initial value problem to have a unique solution is for the P and the Q to be continuous functions on some interval around your initial condition. Right? That right there is sufficient. for existence and uniqueness. That's an important mathematical conclusion that you have to do anytime you develop a new technique, start talking about solving new times of equations, and we could prove that. We could prove it using the previous theorem that we had about existence and uniqueness, which I also didn't prove for you, so I'm hand-waving. We're learning more techniques than we are proofs, so I know you hate that, but uh, from there... Let me, uh, we have time? I oh, only have seven minutes. Um, you don't have to do this in groups. You've got three problems there. Why don't you give them a shot? Um, at least the first one. And um, try and see if you can't get a solution following the technique. So you do one on your own at least before you leave today. Okay? You can do any one of those three that you want, and I'm here to answer questions if you get stuck. And you can ask your neighbor too.